A sharp, insistent jolt in the pre-dawn hours has focused attention on two of the planet's most restless tectonic margins. A magnitude 6.0 earthquake struck offshore 56 kilometers, about 35 miles, east of Tomioka, Japan, at a depth of 46.8 kilometers, around 29 miles. What does a rupture at that intermediate depth really tell us about where strain is stored and how it is released along the Pacific plate margin? Could this be an isolated interslab crack, the signature of slab bending and dehydration? Or is it an element, however small, in a much larger regional rebalancing of stress that includes the recent giant rupture to the north along the Kuril-Kamchatka Trench? Those questions matter because they drive the scientific narrative. Is the event a local expression of long-running internal slab processes or a response, static or dynamic, to far-field changes in stress caused by megathrust ruptures? The raw event details are clear in the immediate catalogues, but the geological story requires reading depth, location and regional tectonics together. The epicentral region of eastern Honshu sits on the eastern flank of the Great Subduction System, where the Pacific Plate dives westward beneath the Okhotsk and Eurasian plates that carry the Japanese archipelago and the Kuril-Kamchatka volcanic arc. The Pacific Plate moves roughly eight centimetres, a little over three inches, per year toward the west-northwest, continuously plunging into the mantle and dragging down vast amounts of oceanic crust and sediments. This relentless movement powers both the shallow megathrust earthquakes that occur along the plate interface near the trench and the deeper intermediate depth earthquakes that occur within the subducting slab itself. The Kuril-Kamchatka margin to the north and the Japan Trench to the south are not separate entities, but interconnected segments of a single colossal tectonic system, a system that cycles through episodes of strain accumulation and release, generating both devastating megathrust ruptures and countless internal slab quakes. At a depth of nearly 47 kilometers, the Tomioka event lies well below the shallow seismogenic zone where the largest interface ruptures typically occur. Instead, it sits within the descending slab in a region known for intermediate depth earthquakes, often referred to as the Wadati Benioff zone. These earthquakes are mechanically different from surface breaking thrusts. They are not driven by frictional failure on the plate boundary, but by internal deformation within the cold, brittle portion of the subducting plate as it bends and undergoes complex mineral transformations. The Pacific plate, as it bends downward into the mantle, experiences intense extensional stresses on its upper surface and compressional stresses on its underside. Where those stresses exceed the rock's strength, faulting occurs, and a rupture propagates through the interior of the slab. Several processes can generate such internal ruptures. The first is slab bending. As the oceanic lithosphere curves downward into the mantle, the outer portion of the plate stretches and fractures, producing normal faulting earthquakes. The second is dehydration embrittlement, a process that occurs when hydrous minerals carried within the slab release water as they are heated and compressed. The liberated fluids reduce effective pressure on faults, allowing them to slip suddenly. The third possible mechanism is transformational faulting, in which minerals such as olivine abruptly change crystal structure under high pressure triggering sheer instability. The Tomioka event's moderate depth suggests slab bending or dehydration embrittlement are the most likely causes, rather than transformational faulting, which typically occurs deeper than 60 kilometers, about 37 miles. Such intermediate depth quakes may not produce surface ruptures or catastrophic tsunamis, but they are vital clues to the inner workings of subduction zones. 
their distribution outlines the geometry of the descending slab and helps seismologists infer its temperature, hydration state, and mechanical behavior. When plotted in three dimensions, these events form inclined seismic planes that trace the trajectory of the subducting Pacific Plate as it sinks into the mantle beneath Japan. The Tomioka quake's location fits neatly within that pattern, a continuation of the same slab that extends northward into the Kuril-Kamchatka region, where the plate finally disappears beneath the Kamchatka Peninsula. But how does this relatively moderate event connect to the immense ruptures that define the history of the northern Pacific Arc? The Kuril-Kamchatka subduction zone has repeatedly produced some of the planet's most powerful earthquakes. In November 1952, an enormous magnitude 9.0 rupture struck east-southeast of Petropavlovsk-Kamchatsky, Russia, at a depth of 21.6 kilometers, about 13 miles, triggering tsunamis that swept across the Pacific. In October 1963, a magnitude 8.5 event occurred 132 kilometers, around 82 miles, east-southeast of Kurilsk at 35 kilometers depth. Another followed in November 1958 with similar characteristics, and again in October 1994 when a magnitude 8.3 quake struck 48 kilometers 30 miles east of Shikotan Island. Even into the 21st century, major ruptures continued. The magnitude 8.1 Tokachi Oki earthquake in 2003 and the magnitude 8.1 Kuril Islands event in 2007. Most recently, on July 30th, 2025, the Kamchatka Peninsula experienced a colossal magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake at a depth of 35 kilometers, 22 miles. That rupture tore across the subduction interface, releasing centuries of accumulated strain and altering the regional stress field. While such great earthquakes have the potential to influence seismicity across a wide area, their static stress changes fade rapidly with distance. The Tomioka event occurred roughly 2,200 kilometers, around 1,367 miles, to the south-southeast of the Kamchatka epicenter, a separation too great for significant direct static stress transfer. However, dynamic triggering remains a possibility. Seismic waves from giant earthquakes can travel vast distances, imparting transient stresses that may jolt critically stressed faults into failure long after the main shock has subsided. Nevertheless, the simplest interpretation is that the Tomioka earthquake represents an independent intraslab rupture rather than a direct consequence of the Kamchatka megathrust. The internal stress field of the Pacific Plate is complex and constantly evolving, shaped by bending at the trench, variations in slab age and temperature, and interactions with the overriding plate. As the plate descends, portions of it become metastable, riddled with dehydration fronts and fault zones that can fail episodically. Each intermediate depth quake relieves a small fraction of that internal stress, momentarily rebalancing forces within the sinking lithosphere. Over geologic time, this process contributes to the gradual mechanical recycling of the plate as it sinks deeper into the mantle. Seismologists will now turn to focal mechanism analyses, moment tensor solutions, and aftershock mapping to resolve the rupture type of this event. If the data reveal tension, axes oriented perpendicular to the trench, it would confirm normal faulting within the slab, supporting the bending hypothesis. If instead it shows compressional features parallel to the slab surface, dehydration processes might be at play. Early waveform modeling and the depth distribution of aftershocks will clarify the orientation of the fault plane and the nature of the rupture.
It is also worth noting that such intermediate depth earthquakes can be important indicators of the mechanical state of the slab. A high rate of these events may signify ongoing dehydration reactions or stress readjustments associated with slab unbending beneath the arc. Tracking them helps researchers forecast how strain is partitioned between the deep slab and the shallow megathrust, ultimately influencing the potential for future great earthquakes. In that sense, even a magnitude 6.0 intraslab event serves as a small but meaningful piece of the much larger tectonic puzzle. The Kuril Kamchatka and Japan Trench System will continue to be a natural laboratory for understanding the Earth's most powerful tectonic forces. These regions remind us that what happens deep beneath the ocean floor, tens of kilometers below our feet, can echo across continents reshaping coastlines and altering the balance of stresses that govern the next major rupture. Every shock from a minor tremor to a massive megathrust writes another chapter in the planet's ongoing geological story. For now, the magnitude 6.0 earthquake east of Tomioka stands as a textbook example of intraslab faulting within the Pacific Plate likely caused by slab bending and dehydration, not by direct interaction with the trench interface. It offers a window into the deep, invisible processes that sustain the endless cycle of creation and destruction along the subduction zones of the Pacific Rim. If you found this analysis insightful, don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel and tap that hype icon to help this video reach a wider audience.